responsible for many of this province's most treasured buildings, Raymond Moriyama now is the subject of an excellent documentary titled Magical Imperfection, The Life and Architecture of Raymond Moriyama. It's having its world premiere on TVO tonight at 9 p.m. and also streaming on TVO.org. The creative force behind that doc is filmmaker and director Scott Colbeck, and he joins us now from Thornhill, Ontario, for more. Welcome. Hi, Scott. Hi, Nan. Um, this documentary was, I went from crying to laughing because Raymond is actually pretty funny. Uh, what led you to make a documentary about Raymond Moriyama? Well, I first heard about Raymond only when the Canadian War Museum opened in 2005. And my interest in history, my background, uh, I, I found that to be a fascinating uh, building. And then when I found out the story of, more about the story of Raymond, I thought he would be an excellent subject for a film. So I called up his office and he invited me to come over and meet him. Uh, we talked, he said he thought this would be a good idea, but it's taken us 15 years to get to this point. Um, that's how film often works, but uh, we're really, uh, raised such a, a great person he uh, his contribution to this we couldn't have done it without him obviously uh, mm -hmm. he gave himself to the film and we're grateful um and it's been worth the wait was it hard to convince him to participate in the documentary no i think our timing was good because the canadian war museum was in a way his uh, final project and he was looking maybe at uh, more of a retirement after that and so the time would be available but it wasn't until 2014 that we actually got him in front of the camera. Uh, we interviewed him in three of his buildings, and uh, it was very important for him to tell his own story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to mention my uh, partner in this, David Hoffert, did a, such a tremendous job in the uh, writing and editing. He really uh, allowed Ray to uh, come forth with this wonderful story, and we get to share this remarkable architecture. Um, you, you know, you walk through cities, you see buildings, and you never really know who designed the buildings. Um, can you give us an idea of some of Moriyama's work in the province of Ontario? Well, sure. Um, the Japanese Canadian Cultural Centre, even though um, it's no longer the same building now, but when it was built in the 1960s, it really was a way for the Japanese community, the Japanese Canadian community, to get to participate again in uh, the Canadian mosaic. And that was important for a people who really had been uh, denied their rights, uh, stripped of their homes and businesses in many cases. Um, but instead of a bitterness, uh, Ray gave them a place to re-inject themselves into the national uh, the culture. And um, it really, uh, like I say, they could, it could have been bitterness, but instead we have a wonderful building that uh, allowed people to share and participate again in a culture they were excluded from in a way that is horrible when you think about it. In the documentary, we do find out more, uh, back, more, more of the backstory to that um, project, but it's really fascinating that a group of them got together and, and contributed towards their uh, community in such a unique way. Yes, it's very inspiring because, as Ray points out, uh, if the mortgage wasn't paid on time, all the people who contributed to it uh, would have gone under and the community, too, would have suffered. But instead, it just showed what they could do, and um, it's been great for the province. And that's just one of the buildings that we could talk about in terms of uh, what it can, what it gave to the, to the province and to the country. The Ontario Science Centre, right? The Ontario Science Centre is uh, interesting because uh, Ray was ridiculed by the museum professionals when he told them that this was to be a hands-on museum. There hadn't been any before that. And until the day it opened, uh, he said it was like having rotten tomatoes thrown at him. But mm. uh, the public spoke. Uh, it became the way that science museums are done going forward throughout the world. What else makes his architecture stand out? To me, it's the fact that his the circumstances of his early life were so different than most people that he was challenged in so many ways. Uh, he decided to be an architect at the age of four when he was confined to a bed for eight months after suffering a terrible burn mm -hmm. and saw a building going up across the street and uh, 
decided that's what he wanted to do. So eight years after that, when uh, the Japanese Canadian community is being interned in British Columbia, um, he saw and lived through what it's like to lose freedom. And that obviously uh, impacted him. And his buildings now all reflect uh, the spirit of equality and freedom and social justice. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just the timing couldn't be uh, better in terms of the discussion that we're having now in the, you know, the broader world. But as Ray said, he's been talking about this for 45 years. So we're just catching up to him. Uh, he was born in Vancouver in 1929. What was it like um, back then growing up Japanese-Canadian during the 1930s and 40s? Well, Ray tells us that the Japanese-Canadian community in Vancouver was very uh, clearly defined. Um, there was boundaries that uh, were uh, considered to be, you know, you didn't necessarily cross, or if you did, you uh, were going into a different kind of world. And there was even uh, a kind of a riot in Vancouver, uh, anti-Asian sentiment was strong. Well, you know, it existed. Uh, that was something that the community had to deal with. And then, of course, uh, 1941, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor led to 22,000 Japanese Canadians uh, losing their freedom in our country, many of them citizens. We have a clip of the documentary. Uh, we'll take a look. Sheldon, please roll. The unfortunate thing about freedom is people don't realize the importance until they lose it. You know, do you ever regain it, freedom? It pricks you all your life. The treatment by the Canadian government during the war will never leave me. After all these 60, 70 years, I still think about it, that injustice is still there. You know, we're not over it. It should have never happened to 22,000 people and should never happen again to any Canadian. Um, his dad was actually imprisoned and he it goes, uh, there's more in the documentary and I don't want to give it away, but how did his time in an internment camp for Japanese Canadians help shape the man that he was to become? Well, um, because of his burn, he was kind of ostracized in the camp. People would uh, make kind of make fun of him or tease him about his bad scars. And he decided he would go and take a bath in the Slocan River, uh, which was not uh, which was outside the camp and was somewhat dangerous because he knew he could be uh, arrested and, you know, uh, sent away like his father. He, he, but he's the man of the family now at age 12, 13. So uh, he built this secret little uh, tree house where he could observe uh, the first to see if anybody was coming because he had to be hidden from people. He was outside the camp. Mm -hmm. But then it gave him a chance to see that nature really was more permanent than this kind of social construct that uh, was denying him his freedom. And it connected his interest in being an architect, um, kind of sustained him through that very difficult period and gave him a sense of hope uh, that maybe he could in the future contribute to this country. And he continues to do that. He, he challenges us uh, to be better than uh, we are in the sense that I mean, we imprison people uh, for no reason other than their race, which um, is horrible when you think about it. But he wants to make Canada a better place. And when you think how how difficult it would be for a child, that, a young man, you know, 12, 13, 14, um, on his own, uh, kind of separated from not only his father, but uh, other people that, uh, in the camp. And instead of being bitter, it, it made him want to make this world a better place. And every one of his buildings uh, gives us a chance to appreciate that. You named the documentary Magical Imperfection. Why that title? Um, Ray tells the story about being in Japan when he was a, a young boy, He's recovering from his burn. He was sent to see a doctor in Japan where his parents still had relatives. And his grandfather, uh, was very uh, instrumental in uh, helping him realize that uh, even though you can strive for perfection, man is not perfect. And maybe there's uh, magic to imperfection. 
And we thought magical imperfections or magical imperfection. My, uh, my wife fine-tuned it a little bit, and we came up with that. And we think that really does speak to Ray and his work. Well, this documentary was perfect, not to sound cheesy. Uh, it was a beautiful piece of art. Thank you so much, Scott. Oh, it's, thank you very much. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.